Well, good morning and welcome to this, our fourth annual University College Public Forum. We respectfully acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of the Kulin Nation and acknowledge the elders past and present of the land on which we now stand. As head of college, I'm delighted to see such a large audience here today, especially with so many school children who have joined us, I should say school students, my apologies, <laughs> who have joined us to participate in this discussion on a most important issue which affects all of our lives. Tomorrow is the 100th anniversary of Anzac Day. If the symbolism and mythology of that event is to mean anything, it must include an affirmation of the values for which so many young Australians fought and died in 1915. And they include freedom from tyranny, open access to information, and the right to decide our own fate in a rapidly changing world. In 2015, we have, of course, gone well beyond blind loyalty to the British Empire, but our system of government is based on the rule of law, the equality of every individual, and respect for the rights of others within that law. It also upholds freedom of expression and the right to vote for a government that will serve the best interests of our community. Many citizens today are concerned that we may have lost sight of some of these values and fear that democracy as we know it is not working as well as it should. So that is why our college governors, Dr Patricia Edgar and Dr Don Edgar, suggested this topic, is our democracy working for today's discussion? And at the outset, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Patricia and Don for their inspiration and dedicated commitment to the organisation each year of this important college event. We are very fortunate to have as our distinguished keynote speaker, Dr Simon Longstaff, CEO of the St James Ethics Centre in Sydney. His long-standing advocacy for an ethical approach to civic engagement, to business dealings and to corporate governments makes him an ideal person to lead us into this debate. Simon has a PhD from Cambridge University and is a fellow of the World Economic Forum. He serves on several boards and committees on corporate responsibility, business ethics and shared values including BHP Billiton, Nestle Oceania and the Australian Directors Corporate Governance Committee. So he can truly speak with authority on the power of corporations in state democracies facing an increasingly globalised world. We have a distinguished panel after morning tea, each of whom I want to welcome and thank for agreeing to participate. They will be introduced later by the panel chair, Dr Don Edgar. As always, we have some of our own University College scholars present who wish to question the panel and of course you, our audience, are warmly invited to contribute as well. So I trust you will be challenged by what you hear this morning and stimulated to engage in this process of keeping our Australian democratic institutions robust and healthy. So now would you please welcome our keynote speaker, Dr Simon Longstaff. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, can I thank the organisers very much for the honour of being invited to speak at this gathering today? And can I also pay my personal respects to the elders past and present of the Kulin Nation? Uh, I'm not going to be able to answer today the question, is our democracy working? And to the way it's phrased, it's almost an empirical question, which I'm sure Sally, as a political scientist, might be better positioned to be able to answer. I'm a philosopher uh, in my training and I'll be drawing on that and so one of the things that you know that philosophers do is that if we can generate a good question then we'll create work for our mates for four or five hundred years uh, and so we're very reluctant ever to answer them but uh, we'll actually what I'll try and do is draw on a number of different areas from my own background to try and help address this question and maybe maybe prompt some thinking about it. In doing so uh, let me just give you a bit of things about my background that perhaps explain why I was prepared to accept the invitation to address this question, apart from the importance of it. Uh, when I was doing my doctorate, uh, what I actually did it about was the topic of democracy. And the question I set out to try and answer was whether or not a nominally democratic government, that is a government claiming the legitimacy of democracy, could use substantive compulsion in order to promote a view of the good life, as opposed to merely reflect a view of the good life. In other words, could you use your power as a state and claiming to be a democratic state to compel your fellow citizens to contemplate or entertain certain views of what a good life ought to be 
or were you limited simply to having that in mind and giving effect to it through the kind of legislation and system you put in place? Now, I won't bore you with the process I went through to try to answer that question, uh, although it is actually something which has fairly uh, profound political implications in the day-to-day -day world because whether or not you have a compulsory national curriculum, for example, is helped to be answered uh, in relation to that question and what you do with people who commit various offences like drink driving, whether you can subject them to compulsory re-education is again affected by how you answer that question. But what it did do is it meant that I had to tackle uh, quite closely with the question of what democracy actually is or ought to be and what are some of its defining features. So I'll spend a little bit of time this morning looking at some of the fairly obvious, there's nothing radical in this, theoretical foundations for what constitutes a democracy as opposed to a different kind of political system. And I'll also draw on other parts of the work that I've done since returning to Australia, which have some bearing upon this question. And that includes uh, something which we do which isn't much known, which is that for about the past decade we've been preparing Australian soldiers and other service personnel just before they're deployed to places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Each group that goes, we spend time with as part of the preparation for some of the particular challenges that arise in conditions of asymmetric warfare. Uh, because in those circumstances, there's no real prospect of defeat if there's a direct contest of arms. So those who oppose us and those things that we stand for, what they're really trying to do through their outrages and provocations is to try and induce us to respond in a disproportionate or indiscriminate manner so that they can challenge whatever moral authority we claim to act upon. And there's a maxim which you can find in various military manual, manuals around counterinsurgency, that if you lose moral authority, you lose the war. At least you do if you're a liberal democracy such as we are. So I engage with these, these, these young men and women before they encounter these things and the sorts of things that the principal was just talking about uh, in terms of echoing you know, the events that are going to be commemorated tomorrow, the 100th anniversary of the landing at Gallipoli, they are live issues. They're, they're not just historical echoes that we should reflect upon. They, they matter because there are still people being deployed in defence of the realities and some of the myths that surround that Gallipoli story. And it is partly myth. Um, all, all stories of this kind take on a, a mythic character. And there were things about the actual situations in Australia that were not especially noble uh, at the time, which people were turning a blind eye to. But there was something in what was happening when Australia deployed its forces overseas in that great conflict which was true inside that myth. It was true that Australia had founded its Commonwealth not through some great battle where there'd been a victorious side over another. It was a peaceful, consensual agreement to bring into existence a new nation. And it is true that those Australian soldiers, when they marched, did so with a kind of loose swagger that represented an ideal where Jack could be as great, as good as his master. And that kind of egalitarian ethos imperfectly applied, but it was something that was aspired to, and that we did have that degree of equality. And those, those values and those principles, which were often sort of put into the notion of concepts of just, a mateship as a kind of form of justice or a fair go, and that egalitarian, just nature, that was true, that there was something of that kind. And it's one of the things against which we might want to index the quality of our democracy today and work out whether or not there are things that are of value that are realised by the political processes we put in place, or whether or not, in fact, so much of that has been sacrificed, and instead what's happened is that there's a kind of machine that operates uh, that seems to have all of the characteristics of a well-oiled political process, without having the underlying substance still preserved in terms of the way the various actors bring to bear their will and their character and their conduct in the course of democratic processes. Now, this issue about whether or not democracy is working has to be informed in part by what our citizens think about this. And I'd say particularly what uh, younger citizens happen to be thinking about. So before I get into some of the philosophy, just a couple of things that we should note. Uh, the last figures I've been able to find, for example, in relation to informal voting, because as everybody here knows in Australia, we don't have compulsory voting, we have compulsory turning up to vote. 
and then what you do with your vote once you've taken your ballot paper is entirely up to you as to whether you cast a valid vote or not. But the incidence of informal voting has been increasing and it's at its highest level now for it has been for, for more than a decade. I think it may be um, a little bit longer and, and others may know the precise figures. It's not a huge percent, it's just under 6%, but nonetheless that's noticeable that it's increasing rather than decreasing. The Lowy Institute has been conducting polls over the last four years or so, looking at what degree of commitment there is within the population to the idea of democracy and its utility as a system for government. And what they've been finding, and I think this is perhaps a troubling figure, is that between 18 and 29 year olds, there are 40% of people who have at best just a provisional commitment to, to democracy, who doubt its real value and by that I think they are saying they doubt its capacity to address the kind of challenges which a society such as ours faces, particularly in a global context. At the moment that's translating not just as a concern about democracy itself, but actually it's being seen in terms of the capacity of particular governments and their democratic mandates actually to do the job. So another study uh, done by Brenton, and this is going back um, a longer period, this is back into the early part of this century, that only about 32.4% as it was of young people had faith in the federal government and the legitimacy of what it was going to do. And I'll come back to that concept of legitimacy a little bit later because it's a very significant and underexplored concept that has an impact upon how we think about this. A concept which actually has greater significance even than I think trust. And I'll explain why I think trust and legitimacy need to be distinguished as concepts and what they mean for democracy. So, Let's get a couple of things from the philosophical perspective sorted out in terms of what democracy is and what is it is not. The first thing is that you can't actually tell what a democracy is by looking at the decision making process which it happens to have chosen. So if you were to say that I will say a democracy is something which has a particular kind of parliament, a particular kind of set of parliamentary processes, a certain number of votes within a certain period of time, if you tried to point to any kind of the machinery that we typically look to, to define what constitutes a democracy as opposed to another kind of political system, then you really are looking at the wrong thing. Because democracy, at least in the world of political philosophy, is defined by a different set of characteristics. The way that political philosophers tend to think about democracy is not so much by the way that decisions are particularly made, a certain form or structure. Rather, what we look to is where it is that authority is ultimately located within the system that exists. And so we tend to distinguish between political systems on that basis in a way that I hope makes clear by saying that a theocracy is a place where the ultimate source of authority is located in God. So theocrats would say, well, that's where authority comes from. We'll infer from that. They'll read into it whatever they can. Uh, an aristocracy, authority is ultimately, so again, in the theory of this, located in the virtuous. A plutocracy locates authority in one's wealth. Uh, and so on and so forth. And you can see that a democracy um, traditionally is distinguished from those systems by saying that the authority ultimately is located in the persons of the governed. Now, typically, uh, that's put into a kind of a shorthand which says it's the people. But more precisely, you look to those who are governed, uh, those who are subject to the laws, to the decision-making process. And that, that group, the, the governed, are in fact able to make all sorts of decisions if they choose so to do around the decision-making processes that they might choose to have for as long as the warrant they extend to those who exercise authority, that is, you know, public power bounded by this warrant, that they can act. So if we wanted to establish today a democracy in this room uh, where we agree that the authority for this democracy will be located in us, those who are going to be governed by whatever rules we might choose to make, then we could choose uh, that Patricia Edgar will make all of the decisions for the next few hours. Now, it may not be a particularly good choice, but you know, that's, that's open to us to do this. And providing she has accepted that we can change that warrant, that is, we could alter the decision-making process to say, well, let's actually have a consensus model where we get together and we'll have workshops and things like that, that would still be consistent with what you would expect in a democracy. So the governed have got considerable latitude not infinite latitude, 
there are certain things that we couldn't do and still claim the legitimacy of democracy. But we have considerable latitude in terms of the particular decision-making process that we have. And this idea of understanding what constitutes democracy as a political idea or a system, which has been expressed in different parts of the world and different times in different kinds of decision-making processes, is essential for trying to understand how we might decide whether the democracy is working or not. But it's because it creates a, a clear criterion, if not multiple criteria as you flesh this out, by which to assess the quality of what you have. Now, let me tell you a true story to indicate where this uh, particular understanding of democracy might lead us in terms of the assessment of our own situation. Back many years ago now, uh, long before many people in this room were born, uh, Gough Whitlam was Prime Minister of Australia. And Whitlam, who has told me this story and confirmed it in person, was in London when he was invited to give a speech to the Mansion House. So this was a gathering of the good and the great from the City of London. People there from financial houses, large and small, sitting in this glorious setting with, you know, starched linen and you know, gold and silver and people in livery and all sorts of things. And his host on this particular occasion was the Lord Mayor of London who, as it happened, was an arch-conservative. Now, Gough Whitlam, uh, thinking of himself to be a campaigning, reforming Labor Prime Minister, was wondering what he could possibly say, by way of a few informal remarks, to get the conversation going before launching into this rather dry economic speech that he was bound to give. And he noticed on a sheet provided by a protocol officer one fact that stood out, and that was that the then Lord Mayor of London was a distinguished oarsman. He'd rowed for his school, he'd rowed for his university, he'd gone on and he'd actually rowed for Great Britain. So Whitlam stood up and said, Your Worship, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, I came here this evening thinking that His Worship and I had absolutely nothing in common. But now I see that we are united by one thing, because as you know, His Worship is a distinguished oarsman and I am a politician. And the thing that unites us is that we both look one way and go the other. <laughs> Sorry, Steph. <laughs> um, now, it's a humorous story, made better for being true. But within it, uh, there are seeds for concern, uh, very grave concern. Because if it's the case that it becomes habitual that you say one thing and do something else, uh, if you uh, careless in the commitments you make, in the language that you use, in the course of your political discourse, particularly if you do this in circumstances where you are contending for the authority that the public can confer through a ballot process, then you begin to undermine uh, not just a kind of a popular trust that might be expected of people in terms of the ordinary commerce of exchange between people, but you begin to undermine the very foundations of what makes a democ democracy possible. Because if democracy is fundamentally understood as being defined by the fact that authority ultimately is located in the persons of the governed, and if it is their warrant through consent, however imperfectly expressed through a ballot, that this whole system depends upon, then the quality of that consent is fundamentally degraded each and every time citizens express their view based on information that is false, incomplete or misleading. There cannot be any democratic consent that has anything that we would understand by that term, free, prior and informed. Particularly, it cannot be informed consent if the run-of-the-mill practice is simply to say, well, you know, they'll understand that we didn't quite mean it when we said it, that the exigencies of actual government were such that we could set this aside without any consequences. Uh, because in that sense, uh, what was it that was actually conferred at the ballot box, other than just some kind of mechanical mark being placed upon a box in, you know, on a list based on relative ignorance? 
Uh, this, is, this is fundamentally, once it becomes a, a, a practice that's established, at odds with what you would expect in a democracy that has any capacity to work as it is expected to do. Now, this is not to say that from an ethical perspective one can never ever change one's mind, that can, one can never ever explain the circumstances in which you may have made a commitment that you couldn't possibly honour given the circumstances in which you find yourself. Another very important maxim that arises, at least in Western philosophy, comes from Immanuel Kant, that ought implies can, that you're not obliged to do that which is impossible. So there may be practical limitations. But again, within the tradition that, um, that I draw on, there is a whole narrative around what one does when you exercise public power in circumstances where you have to violate the canons that you would normally expect to be in place in order to maintain the legitimacy of what you do. And this is wrapped up, if you like, in, in some of the political philosophy around what's called the problem of dirty hands. It's usually expressed in much more extreme circumstances, but you can find this in the work of Weber, or you can look into uh, a particularly powerful essay by the academic Michael Walzer, in which the question is asked whether those who exercise public power must be on occasions prepared to get their hands dirty for the sake of the public good. And the case that Walzer looks at is an extreme one in which it might involve the application of torture in circumstances where the individual concerned would be horrified to have to approve it, in which it may nonetheless be considered necessary to save innocent lives and it's thought to be the only practical circumstance available, even if it may be marginal in its prospects for success. And I won't go into the pros and cons of this because that's a debate for another time. The point about Voltz's uh, essay is that he sets out three conditions that you would look for for people who are going to get their hands dirty. And I'll use the breaking of promises as an example of this for where politicians find themselves in situations which they could not possibly have anticipated. The first of these uh, requirements is that the person who is going to, say, break their word and therefore violate some of the basic expectations of democracy is that they must loathe the possibility that they might have to do it, that they might genuinely be appalled that they are put in a situation where they could even contemplate it, and that if they choose so to do this, they will forever judge themselves harshly for having made such a decision. The second requirement that Walzer puts is that, that if it is strictly necessary, they may actually have to do it, if it's necessary. But the third step that he puts in is that and if they do this, they will insist on paying the price for having made that choice. They will insist on being punished for making the decision. Now, you might not want to extrapolate from Waltz's extreme examples around the torture and things to the question of promise keeping and otherwise, but I think we should. I think what we should expect in terms of this core obligation in terms of our democracy is that you should make promises with every commitment that you have to keep them, that you should be careful in making sure that you actually understand the conditions under which you make that promise. And if you are not reasonably assured that you can keep it, then it's something better not made. Secondly, I think that if you had ever to break it, you should be appalled by the prospect of doing so because of the damage you will know you will do not just to yourself, but potentially to the democratic system itself. And I'll come to that in a moment. But thirdly, if you feel that it is strictly necessary, that there really is an overwhelming case in terms of public policy and the public interest to do this, that you may do it, but finally that you will insist on paying the price that you will do it. Now this is to set an extraordinarily high standard for those who go into public office, but I'm going to argue that it's a standard that you must uphold when you volunteer for public service of this kind. And let's remember that no one is conscripted into public service in Australia. Every person who stands for elected office does so voluntarily. Every person should do so knowing full well the obligations that fall upon them. So the first thing to do is to say, do we have a good enough understanding of what are the implications of democracy itself? The second thing to say about our democracy and whether it's working is to look at some of the actual institutions that have grown up around it and whether or not they are operating in a way that understands this. Now, political parties have become a, a really interesting phenomenon and their impact upon the system. And I'll speak here in New, from somebody who lives in New South Wales, where we have a, despite the, the, the waxing and waning powers of ICAC, 
We've had some pretty um, spectacular examples of corruption, particularly coming from the Labor Party, but not exclusively so there, uh, with the Liberals uh, being... I should say, to the credit of the National Party, there's never been subject to any taint, uh, at least in, in relation to that. We've got a representative from here today, so I should acknowledge that. But there in New South Wales, political parties, which are private associations, let's never forget this, they're, they're not public bodies. They are entirely private associations where people come together for a number of reasons, but one of the principal ones being to contest for public power. And one of the problems we've had now in the way that those political parties have operated is that with increasing frequency, they seem, and I, and I can't say that this is definite, but it seems to me that they have lost a sense of their underlying purpose and instead have become masterful in the, the operation of the political machine. Uh, they become extraordinarily adept at getting the machine to do what it does. And so you see that in, perhaps more so in, in Liberal and Labor than others, but definitely there, that there's become almost a professionalisation of the political class. People who might become union officials and then move into advisory roles in ministers' offices, uh, and then it's the, kind of the equivalence that you find in, in, in the Liberal Party at least, where their engagement with a world that would have been recognised by earlier parliamentarians. I mean, certainly after the Second World War, if you look at the constitution of the Australian Parliament, there was greater diversity. You've got train drivers and lawyers, all sorts of people there who have many bonds that unite them. That the emergence of a kind of political class who are defined by their capacity to work that machine means that these private associations in their contest for power have started to act in ways which don't merely damage their standing, but damage public institutions. And you may remember my saying early on in this address that there were evidence coming from the Lowy polls to show a 40% of young people only have at best a partial commitment to, to democracy, that they question the legitimacy of particular governments. Well, that's also happening to all of the machinery around democracy, that people are wondering, what's the point of a parliament if the parliament is always dominated by the votes that rarely allow for a conscience vote, where the machine itself has predetermined the outcomes. What is the role and value of such an institution if the seats are occupied by people who are prepared to do pretty much anything as long as they don't get caught uh, in order to secure the power, including to engage in conduct which, whatever the legislation might be saying, is corrupt? I mean, I didn't think we would see again a day where money was being handed around in brown paper bags. But if you followed the ICAC inquiry of last year in New South Wales again, a particular gentleman was turning up in his Bentley and handing out 10,000 bucks literally in a brown paper bag. Now, it used to be when um, Bob Askin was doing this in New South Wales, he was receiving the money. This time it's the politicians handing it out and, and developers and all sorts of things. But, you know, that's, that's, that's a, a, a private set of arrangements being made which are having implications for our public institutions. And so it is that, in the sense, they're trashing the way people think about parliament, about the parliamentary processes and things, and that cannot be good for democracy, and I think it lies very much in relation to the way things are happening. Now, of course, there are supposed to be checks and balances that are guarding against this, and some of that is supposed to be in the hands of the media, which shrouds itself in the status of being considered the fourth estate. The media, um, particularly uh, the commercial media, will regularly argue its case that it performs a public purpose in order to identify, investigate and report upon corruption and other malfeasance that takes place within the political class. But at best what they do is only a partial service to that ideal. Now, there are some people like Kate McClymont in New South Wales through the, you know, the Fairfax Press who's investigated corruption. There's a hell of a lot that goes on in the Australian media that actually degrades politics rather than ennobles it and actually is part of this vicious cycle that is affecting the quality of our democracy in this country. For example, the relentless pursuit by the media of the gotcha moments uh, in their engagement with people in politics cannot be helpful because it means that a thoughtful politician who wants to consider in a way that would engage their public, that there might be possible that you would increase a tax here, that you might distribute the goods in a way that would benefit a class of people who would otherwise not be counted. That 
whole system is degraded when politicians say, oh, I got you. And, and the kind of headlock is, idiot politician speculates about tax increase, as if there couldn't be a sensible argument. Uh, poor old Joe Hockey, um, in the course of releasing the intergenerational report, actually asked a really important question when he posed, well, what does it mean for us if people are going to live to be 150? Now, that is not out of the question. There are people in universities around the world who are seriously working on the means by which that will become true. And the implications of it are serious ones that we need to discuss. And yet Hockey, when he asked the question, was roundly pilloried as a fool for having posed that. Where did that happen? In the media. Rather than seeing this as an opportunity where you think as the fourth estate, which claims the privileges, you know, shield laws and other things for this purpose, let's have a proper conversation about this, Hockey was re reduced to that. And so what you see is the implications of this is that people nowadays pull their head back in, they're less likely to speculate about what could be an interesting and radical policy. They reduce their comments to something that can be captured in a sound bite. Whereas in an earlier time, the Times of London might have published a full speech from Parliament on the back page, where you could read a very well argued set of propositions. Nowadays, what you'll get is the thing which is crafted just for that 15, 10, five seconds, whatever it is, 140 characters that will actually be noticed and shared. And given that communication is the oxygen that sustains people in politics, why wouldn't you see them being changed in the way that they operate, driven by this? Now, you'd hope that they might say, oh, no, I'm not going to collude in that system, but realistically, they're not bound to, but they tend to. So you've got a number of different dimensions here, and, and others during the course of the panel will no doubt uh, draw attention to different features, ones that I've only lightly touched upon and deserve much greater exploration. But if you look at the role of the media in an Australian society and its intersection with politics, if you look at the role of political parties with their preference to run the machine for reasons that are not always clear other than just securing power for itself rather than for some defining end that we can all understand and support. If you look at certain habits that creep into the way in which power is exercised, including in the contest to secure it, which means that the population is often making an uninformed and therefore undemocratic decision when they come to vote. All of these things are reasons to have concern. Now, you might think that this is a rather kind of depressing position to get at, that I'm not particularly optimistic, but in fact, I'm hugely optimistic about what might be done around this, because I actually think that we can explain how this happens. And because we can explain it, it's capable of being redressed. In general, what I think happens to societies is that we are subject to what I call a long age of forgetting. That is, we often form institutions where we have moments of deep and profound insight that give rise to them, only then to become distracted by the subsequent manifestations, the ornate additions to the central idea that distract us from the foundations on which they were built. And because we are no longer attending to the foundations on which institutions stand, they progressively are allowed to erode. Because it's not sexy, it's not interesting, it's not fun to look at those things. And over time, these glittering structures, whether they be, if you like, cathedrals or great parliamentary buildings or spires for corporations or whatever it is, they are so distracting and the foundations become so neglected that they ultimately begin to topple. And what effectively brings them down in social institutions of this kind is hypocrisy. The perception that the things that they claim to stand for are no longer true, and generally the public, which is much smarter than they're often allowed to be, allowed for, uh, gets this and starts to withdraw its support until things eventually crash. And so you can see churches, for example, in their response to the sexual abuse of children and schools and other things, falling because, not just because of the things they do that are inherently wrong, but because the nature of their response is inconsistent with what they claim themselves to stand for and they don't even notice the hypocrisy. And it's the hypocrisy that ultimately brings them down. And you see corporations that say that they stand for one thing, it might be around financial probity and the safety of the people whose money they deal with, and yet they betray them by the provision of dodgy financial advice without even understanding that the hypocrisy of their conduct is not just a regulatory failure, but it's a body blow to a trust in the system. And you see this time and time again, 
where we forget the purpose for which things have been established. We betray them without even realising that we do so. We unleash the hypocrisy which causes people to disengage and then things seem to be so terrible. And of course I've told you a story in part which is about the hypocrisy that can infect politics and damage democracy. Now the good news is that if we wanted to, we could go back to the foundations. We could clear away some of the, the surface and look back at them and ask, what is our democracy for, in this case? What are the underlying values and principles that ought to inform it? And how can we invest the structures that we have today with new life? Now, we may actually do that and end up telling exactly the same story as those centuries ago told. The difference would be, though, that for the first time in all of those centuries, they would be our stories. They would be invested with a kind of contemporary life rather than just being the dead hand of tradition invested in a system which doesn't even realise when that tradition is being set aside. That's the possibility. And some of the things we're starting to see in Australian politics are actually a realisation of that. So, for example, there's a lot of discussion that you hear at the moment about there being volatility in the Australian electorate. I don't think there is any volatility. I think the Australian electorate is stable in its expectations. It knows what it wants. It just can't find it. I think the Australian electorate knows that it wants people who are careful with the promises they make, who are committed to the truth that they're prepared to utter, that are prepared to pay the price if they get it wrong. I think they're looking for a quality of commitment in the political parties or the individuals where they're independent or in loose coalitions that are there, and they're trying to find this. And it's their disappointment, their constant disappointment, which is being manifest in different choices being made, flipping from one party to another or going for independence here or there. The notion that there is something wrong that has to be fixed in our system to try and rig it so that we don't express our disappointment in a way that causes unexpected change should be considered an offence to us as the citizens of this country. The major parties have been trying to stitch up a deal in the Senate to try and ensure that you can't have the kind of balance of power situation that's there at the moment. And they'll try and get things so that even if you think that the preference whisperers and their quirky deals have brought about a degree of uncomfortable tension for governments, I don't think that saying, well, we'll fix this so that the Australian people can't choose that is the way to go. You as citizens, whatever your allegiance, whatever party you support or independent or group, should be thinking, is that really the way to go? That the attempt to frustrate what we might choose to do as we search around for an appropriate representative for our ideal of a representative democracy, is that really the answer? You're starting to see groups emerge across where, where all of the normal boundaries that would exist, that distinguish Conservative from Labor, from Green or whatever, are obliterated. So I've, I've noticed, for example, the Voices for Indi campaign in this state. Um, actually attended a grouping of people there over a couple of days where I think 300 people came off their farms and out of their shops to talk about democracy. And the people in the room, God, they were uh, hardline gnats and there were, you know, people from Labor and there were Greens and there was a 12-year-old girl who wanted to be Prime Minister one day and there's an 86-year-old who's worried about the country that they're living in. It was an extraordinary collection of citizens who didn't seem to be bound by anything more than a concern about the quality of their democracy. That is the people optimistically engaging. Well, what do we do? How do we do it? Is it a different kind of model? Do we have charter groups which create general principles of government where it may not be a party with its type boundaries, but it might be a group of people who agree some general principles and stand in a coalition which isn't as tight as a party but isn't as loose as just a collection of independents? What are the innovations that a democracy might produce given the liberty we have to set our own decision-making processes within the framework of our constitution. This is, I think, reason for optimism. And what I'm starting to see and I'm starting to hear about is that those conversations are just not being limited to North East Victoria. There are people typically actually in rural and regional Australia where the, the sense of bonds and community are, are, are strong and close. That's starting to happen, happen in Western Australia and in North East New South Wales and other things, and this is the community as it should do in a democracy responding. Now, what it's going to be looking for is the need to restore 
or at least preserve something which I mentioned to you before, which is not trust in our political system, but the legitimacy of it. And this is essential. For me, I came to understand the importance of this when I was listening one morning to the radio descriptions of Muammar Gaddafi and how he was hiding somewhere in the deserts of Libya. Gaddafi at the time had, before his fall, vast reserves of money from his oil fields, huge stocks of weapons, a massive army mainly fed by mercenary power, all of the organs of the state at his disposal, and yet he was the one hiding in the desert. So what was missing? What did he not have? Well, the one thing that Gaddafi did not have at the end of his term was legitimacy. And it got me to think about how important this concept is. Because you see, what happens in trust? We talk a lot about it, but trust is usually offset when it declines by a willingness to increase other costs. So it's often, you know, you'll take on additional burdens to compensate for a decline in trust. If, if a group of people can make, reach an agreement by shaking hands and, and abiding by that, very low cost system to have. But if you don't trust each other and you think you need detailed contracts and systems of inspection and surveillance and enforcement, that just the cost goes up and up. And what happens is that people will typically, not with a lot of love for the idea, but uh, with, with regret but, and concern, but they will, OK, we'll, we'll increase the cost. We'll find ways to curb those conduct or to regulate it to make an offset, if you like, for the lack of trust. But no amount of money, no amount of cost will be borne when legitimacy is lost. And one of the things I fear for at the moment is that if our system was ever to get to the point where particularly younger people question the fundamental legitimacy of what we do, that democracy was a legitimate system, then there won't be an easy road back from that. Because once you lose legitimacy, and I don't know, to be honest, I find it a fascinating concept because I can't find much written about it. And I don't understand it well enough myself even as to how you secure it, how you preserve it, and how you retain it. All I know is that when it's gone, people won't deal with you. Even if you give them a huge amount, no, I'm not going to deal with you. you, you you're gone. So I'm, I'm inviting it something that we need to, to investigate a lot further. So we need to think about this as to what's going to preserve it. Now, one of the things that I think we need to do is to start to recognise that in our society at the moment, there are a number of invisible people. Um, Robert Menzies famously gave essays, a series of talks on radio in 1942, which became the kind of philosophical foundation of the Liberal Party, and they were called the forgotten people speeches where he talked about the forgotten people. My concern is the invisible people, the people who don't get seen under the arrangements we have at the moment. So if you live in a marginal electorate under the current kind of political logic, uh, it's quite possible that your concerns will be attended to with considerable um, focus by people who want to secure your vote. Being in a marginal electorate is a really good place to be if you want to be noticed. If you live in a safe electorate, where it's safe, whether for Labor or Liberal or whatever, and what they are now, given some of the changing votes, is difficult to know. But if you're in what's considered to be a safe seat, pretty easy to be ignored, you know, taken for granted, uh, in a sense, to become invisible. Unless you are seen to matter in some way for those who are contending for power, it's easy to be set aside. And the old conventions that used to exist in which everybody would be noticed, in which the Australian Public Service, for example, was set up to be a corrective against that, so that they had this kind of universal gaze where they would see everybody. This would be uh, a situation that we need to reinforce. Because if we allow that trend to continue, in which political parties are operating just a machine without an underlying philosophical or political purpose, if you allow a situation to occur in which people can be invisible because their vote doesn't count, even though their needs are just as pressing as any other citizen, if you allow private associations to contend for powers in ways that calls into question the legitimacy of public institutions, and including democracy itself, if all of those things are in place, then you find yourself risking that particular situation in terms of the legitimacy of the system itself. Now, one last thought about what risks damaging our democracy and what we might need to do and restore it. And it's to do with language and the kind of language that counts today. If you were tracking the debate that surrounded the 
issue of petrol sniffing in Central Australia about a decade ago, around Mutajula and places like that, you would have heard poignant descriptions of young people whose lives were being destroyed because they had access to the volatiles in standard petrol. And you would have heard that BP had actually developed a fuel called Opal Fuel, which could be supplied, which was perfectly good for running all of the equipment that needed it, but didn't have those volatiles and therefore didn't risk the health and lives of those young people. And there was a debate. Should we or shouldn't we introduce this? Now, the question was ultimately resolved when I think one of the companies involved went to Access Economics. An Access Economics report presented a report that showed that if you didn't provide Opal Fuel, it would cost too much. It would cost more to treat people who were being harmed by the volatiles and were in hospital and whose lives were being lost than would be the cost of introducing the petrol and putting in new pumps or whatever they needed. And so the decision was made, well, OK, well, that's pretty clear. It costs too much if you let people die or get sick. Let's bring in the petrol. So I thought that was an interesting conversation as to how this was resolved. A little bit later, the environment movement was considering the whole issue about climate change. And Nicholas um, oh, Stern, thank you, now Lord Nicholas Stern, published his report that said, well, look, you know, on behalf of the World Bank, we can debate climate change in terms of issues to do with future generations and ethical obligations, but we, we don't need to, because if we don't deal with climate change, it's going to cost too much. And so the environmental movement changed all of their language and they said, well, it's okay, well, let's, let's take Stern's report. This must be the, the final nail in the coffin of the sceptics, you know, economics will prevail. And of course, it turned out that it didn't. Uh, because other people, once the argument was conceded, that it was about economics, mounted their own contrary economic arguments. 2008 and 2009, and again earlier this year, some charities that were established in order to bring about the end to child abuse decided that it was necessary for them in order to make their case that they should go to access economics, or in this case, I think that just latterly it was a different group, in order to have an economics report produced to show that child abuse costs too much. Now, what kind of society is it that thinks that it couldn't decide to try and bring an end to child abuse except for the case that ultimately it costs too much? What kind of language have we privileged? And it's a matter of privilege, not a contribution to political discourse, such that every question can only ultimately be decided by recourse to a calculation of economic utility. Now, let me be very clear here. I'm not saying let's forget about economics. It's essential that we make those kinds of assessments, that we do that. It's more about what kind of language we think counts for an argument that we as a populace, as a polity, would accept. And what it's telling us about where we're heading at the moment. I've even noticed recently, I had a discussion recently with some of the people who head up big superannuation funds. It turns out that in Australian law, there's a question as to whether any superannuation fund could give any consideration to a profound ethical question, or are they bound only ever to consider a purely economic calculation of where their members' interests lie. So let's suppose there was the most wicked, evil thing you can imagine. Let's suppose you're in 1938 Germany and you're being asked whether or not to invest in the economic enterprises of the Waffen SS the day after Kristallnacht. The argument is that currently under Australian law, unless you could find a way to kind of configure an economic argument that it's not a good idea to invest in the SS, and in 1938 that didn't look like that, you could have made that judgment, you would be bound to do so because we've given a certain particular privilege embedded even in law in relation to excluding ethical considerations as proper considerations. Contrast that to a couple of hundred years ago when someone like William Wilberforce is standing at the dispatch box in the House of Commons arguing, as he did over decades, for the abolition of slavery. Can we imagine Wilberforce standing there saying, the enslavement of another human 
person is an abomination. It's a violation of the essential respect for persons. We, we must, we must, we must abolish this pernicious trade. And if you're not convinced, I have a report from Access Economics to show that it costs too much. <laughs> Of course he didn't. He didn't need to. There was a debate of that. But his arguments were founded on a different conception of what a democracy could respond to by way of argument that actually carried weight. So I'm going to finish up maybe a minute or so earlier than I should by asking us to consider within the context of all of the various things that I've touched upon in terms of whether our democracy is working as to whether or not part of the question lies in what we count as a valid argument as a public listening to the political discourse about what we ought to decide as a democratic polity. When we exercise our choice, if we're allowed so to do with an informed basis, do we hear the voice of those in a political party who might want to go back to a tradition in which they invoke an ideal, a pragmatic ideal that might inform what they want? Or are we becoming so conditioned that we only hear the economic argument of rational economic utility as the only thing that ultimately counts? And where does our responsibility lie in that? As I said, I'm an optimist about our democracy. I, I think when I talk to those young people who head off to Iraq, they carry with them some ideal of what it could be that they're there. They're not just going because they've been told to. There, there's a sense of what this country stands for, even if it's only at the mythic level. I'm optimistic that those 40% of people who at the moment are questioning the utility of democracy to deal with big problems could come to see that it has the resources to do this. I'm optimistic that though that that's going to require us to end this long age of forgetting as to what democracy is and what it needs to work and that we could have a new conversation which I see breaking out in places like Indi and up in the northwest, northeast New South Wales and in the west and others where citizens might become clearer and clearer about what they expect from those who contend for power and that on the basis of that we could have a fresh conversation, refound our democracy on renewed, renewed foundation stones and that it could flourish in the future. And on that, what I hope is an optimistic note, I will end. Thanks. Well, on, uh, on behalf of University College and all its residents here, I'd like to say thank you, Dr. Longstar, for that uh, fantastic uh, keynote, keynote address.